what can a flagship card from 2013 do in old and modern games? This is a nostalgic review of the GTX 780 Ti. Hope you have fun watching. While the entire internet is covered with reviews and discussions of the latest video cards and many tech bloggers are already looking to the future in the hope of guessing what tomorrow will bring us in terms of next-gen products, I decided to go back in time in search of something interesting. I decided to fulfill my childhood dream and order two 213 flagship GPUs on eBay. The first is the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 780 Ti and the second is the AMD Radeon R9 290X. These two GPUs were the legends of their time whose battle will be just as heated as their power consumption since they basically consume and give off heat like an actual stove. This is the first video from the Nostalgic Trilogy and if we get a lot of views and likes, I will be doing some more videos like this in the future. In this video, we will begin with the GTX 780 Ti. How did it come to be? First, let's rewind the clock to the end of 2013. Nvidia had already introduced older models of the already familiar Kepler architecture family, notably shocking the public with the powerful and expensive GTX Titan, and then reassuring gamers with the introduction of the GTX 780. Nvidia was so confident in its abilities in the high-end segment that it did not hesitate to release the GTX 780 Ti, even with a higher price tag, at the start, they asked for $699 for the card, but the GTX Titan was the one to break the $1000 price tag. At the same time, the regular 780 cost $649, but with the release of the 780 Ti, its price dropped to $499. The same GK110 chip, which was in the GTX Titan, was the same chip in the GTX 780 Ti, but in its full glory with noticeably more streaming multiprocessors and texture units, and the frequencies were also higher. In terms of gaming performance, the GTX 780 Ti was one of the best cards to have. The specs were consistent with their era. 3GB of fast GDDR5 memory with a frequency of 7000 MHz, a 384-bit bus and a rated 250 watts of power consumption. The only downside against the competition was the 3GB of VRAM, since the R9 290 and the 290X already had 4GB offerings. At the time, the 3GB of VRAM was enough, but as time went on, the VRAM definitely became an issue, but more on that later. In terms of performance, the GTX 780 Ti is approximately at the level of the GTX 1060 3GB or a 1650 Super. And speaking of video cards, you can find the best video cards of 2024 linked in the description. As for power consumption, the 780 Ti was quite demanding and could consume up to 300 watts in some variations of the card. However, a lot of time has passed since then and that kind of power consumption has become the new norm for flagship GPUs. Looking at some of the benchmarks of that era, everything was pretty boring. In some games, the 780 Ti was faster, in others, the R9 290X would win. But before we get a more in-depth look at the benchmarks, let's see what we're working with. This is the reference design of the 780 Ti. It's rocking a classic blower style edition cooler and picking it up it feels heavy and well built. But it was a flagship of its time so it was the best of the best. Sadly we don't see a lot of blower style flagship designs anymore due to the cooling requirements of modern cards. Since the card is nearly 11 years old, it made sense to show it some love by giving it some fresh thermal paste since the card was heating up to 96 degrees in Fermac which is quite a lot so I decided to disassemble it and see what was under the hood. Having unscrewed lots of screws, I removed the cooler, disassembled it, and I have to say there was a surprising amount of screws on the reference model cards, most with different sizes and shapes. The disassembly process was a bit complicated since the previous owner had stripped through most of the screws, no doubt in an attempt to also give the card some servicing. Eventually, I was able to get it open. The cooler consists of two separate heatsinks, one is more decorative than practical, but the main one is your typical heatsink with a vapor chamber. Everything was quite dusty and the thermal pads needed to be replaced. The thermal paste to the card was relatively fresh, but there wasn't enough of it applied. Overall, I spent about 2 hours servicing the card, I replaced some of the thermal pads, I lightly cleaned the thermal pads on the memory chips because they seemed to be in good condition, and I didn't have any more extras to replace them with. I also had to apply some new thermal paste on the chip, and since I had some liquid metal left over, I decided to apply it instead of regular thermal paste in an attempt to lower the temps a bit more efficiently. Naturally, before applying liquid metal, you must first isolate the SMD capacitors around the chip and I bought a compound that is just designed for this. 
After applying the new thermal paste, I put it back together in the hope that nothing went wrong. The results were kind of underwhelming to be honest. After all that cleaning and repasting, I was hoping to get a drop in temperature by at least 10 to 15 degrees, but the temps dropped by only 3 to 5 degrees. The upside, however, was the increase in frequency of the chip, from 875 to 901 MHz in the Pharmac test. After that, it was time for some gaming benchmarks. One thing to note is that Nvidia dropped official driver support for the 600 and 700 series of GPUs back in 2021. The only type of updates these cards get are security patches. Due to the lack of driver support and the lack of full support for DX12 and recent shader versions, some games would not launch at all on the GTX 780 Ti. Games like The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Hogwarts Legacy, Alan Wake 2, Remnant 2, Elden Ring, Horizon Forbidden West all showed errors when attempting to launch. So our test bench consists of the AMD Ryzen 7 5800X with 32 gigs of uh, 3600 MHz RAM and a couple of 1TB SSDs. Don't mind the overkill nature of the system but it's going to make sure the GPUs are the only limiting factors here. Starting a brief look into some benchmarks using Superposition benchmark software and the rendering speed in DaVinci Resolve and then we go directly to the gaming benchmarks. All tests were performed in 1080p with some anti-aliasing. Let's start with the games from the early 2010s. The first being Crisis 3. In one of the heaviest locations to run, with the legendary grass, coupled with 4 times MSAA, we get 40 to 50 FPS. By reducing the quality of the anti-aliasing, we nearly get double the FPS. The third Crisis and the Kepler GPU are the same age, so they seem to get along very well. The game is still a suitable stress test for video cards from that era with a lot of settings to play around with, beautiful graphics and some decent anti-aliasing despite being over a decade old. In the meantime, watch the tests, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel as this helps us in promoting the video. The next game I tested was Tomb Raider 2013. In the built-in benchmark it's not as good as we'd hope as we get 35 to 45 FPS with some areas getting up to 60 FPS maximum. You can greatly improve FPS by turning off the AMD hair simulation feature, Tress FX, and reducing the anti-aliasing to FXAA. The next game is the first Watch Dogs. This was one of the beloved Ubisoft projects of its time. One could have argued it was a GTA 5 killer as it was a very good looking game. And despite the poor optimization at the moment of its release, it was later fixed and the game became a fresh new open world game that revolutionized the open world genre. And the modding community also helped in making it a more enjoyable and visually appealing experience. Looking back at that time years later makes you realize that that was probably the best release of the series. As for the FPS, it runs really well considering that we're playing on ultra graphic settings with the best anti-aliasing and features like HBAO Plus enabled. We get over 50 FPS most of the time, however there are noticeable micro stutters probably due to the maxing out of VRAM but it's more than playable so the trade-offs are worth it. The next game is Assassin's Creed Unity. This is yet another classic Ubisoft game from the era when the franchise wasn't yet a sad meme or a laughing stock. The game had incredible art design and graphics and it had its fair share of bugs at the start, but over time, with more updates and patch releases, the game eventually ran better. In our testing, we got 30 to 40 FPS on ultra graphics settings and that's the best our card could do. To get more FPS, then you would have had to lower the settings and reduce the anti-aliasing to increase performance. The next game is Watch Dogs 2. Playing on very high settings, optimization aside, we got 35 to 40 FPS without the lag or micro stutters we experienced in other games, so overall not a bad gaming experience. The next game is Far Cry 4. Playing on ultra settings. This was another classic Far Cry release, you get to fight a war you want nothing to do with and in the case of Far Cry 4, most of the player base agrees that it would have been fun playing as a pagan main supporter rather than the other way around, but we are here to talk about performance and the game is a noticeable upgrade from Far Cry 3's visuals and graphics and playing on Ultra, the 780 Ti holds up well with a stable 65 to 70 FPS, so it's safe to say it's a very playable experience. The next game is Battlefield 4. 
2011 was yet another year of good first and third person shooter games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and Battlefield 3. Call of Duty completed an epic story trilogy and Battlefield ventured into the online multiplayer scene and achieved great success, so much so it's arguably one if not the best Battlefield game to date. Given the success of Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4 folded with the improved graphics and mechanics and a similar multiplayer mode for the massive fanbase of its predecessor. So how did our 780 Ti perform? It was able to easily max out everything at ultra and get 60 to 70 FPS at all times, so a very playable experience with max eye candy graphics. The next game is The Witcher 3. This is another classic title release that launched with an amazing storyline and hundreds of hours worth of adventure with over 200 quests and Witcher contracts and yes, you could enjoy the game with a GTX 780 Ti. We were able to get around 45 to 50 FPS when riding Roach around Novigrad and this is acceptable performance for a single player title like this. The next game we looked at is Battlefield 1. This was the top selling game in the US in the month of its release and it was the 10th installment in the Battlefield series and the first main entry in the series since Battlefield 4 in 2013. It was a good looking game and a decently optimized one at that too. The GTX 780 Ti got 60 to 70 FPS on Ultra which is very playable so you can definitely enjoy this game with a 780 Ti despite the age difference. Next, let's look at Quantum Break. This was a 2016 action-adventure third-person shooter game that was an Xbox and Windows exclusive title that was the most successful release since the release of the Xbox One at the time. Despite some minor optimization issues, the game ran noticeably better on AMD Radeon than on Nvidia, but we still got an acceptable 45 FPS, which is enough for a single-player shooter. PUBG is another popular multiplayer title we tested. There was a time PUBG was the most played battle royale title with over a million players daily on Steam charts, but those days are long gone. Regardless, if you have a GTX 780 Ti and you wanted to play the game, then you can comfortably do so playing at medium settings with 80 to 90 FPS with a smooth frame time graph, which is a very playable experience. The next game tested is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This was a well received game at the time of release and it's well optimized enough that we can definitely still run the game at 40 to 50 fps on high settings with the 780 Ti which is remarkable to say the least. Now we move on to Far Cry 5. Looking at the VRAM usage, we might end up running out of VRAM even if the game doesn't need as much and Hope County looks absolutely amazing and the game feels nice, we get around 40-50 to 50 FPS with some optimized settings so it's still a playable experience. Battlefield 5 is next. This is one of the games in the series surrounded by mixed reviews where some seem to have absolutely loved it while others did not share the same enthusiasm. But it's still a beautiful game and it had a decent campaign for the single player fanbase and it also introduced ray tracing but obviously not for the 780 Ti. However, we were able to run the game on ultra and get a smooth and stable 40 to 45 FPS. Next game is Apex Legends. This is another free to play battle royale shooter and since many people like to play eSport titles like these with competitive settings to get the most performance with your hardware, we also did the same. And the results did not disappoint. When disembarking from the ship, the FPS does drop and struggle to stabilize a bit but once we get to the ground, we get over 100 FPS with a smooth frame time graph so it's a very enjoyable experience. The next game is Control. This is a 2019 action adventure game similar to Quantum Break that has excellent physics and the 780 Ti is able to run the game at a stable 40 to 50 FPS at medium settings with 2 times MSAA which is not bad at all. The next game is Days Gone. This is a very underrated game that I would recommend if you like survival shooters with a massive open world and you get to fight some of the largest hordes of zombies which could be as fun as it is challenging. The game runs fine on the GTX 780 Ti at around 40 to 50 FPS provided you don't get to run into any zombie hordes as that tanks the performance a bit but it should still stay above 30 FPS which is playable for this kind of game. 
The next game is Cyberpunk 2077. This is a game known for being very demanding, so it's no surprise that even at medium settings, it turned out to be too much for our Kepler flagship, which could only do 20 to 30 FPS, with massive stutters on the frame time graph. To be fair, the game is known to be hard to run even with modern hardware, but we can always lower the settings to increase performance. I did attempt to use FSR to see if it would help but it doesn't seem to work the way it should since it would black screen and show random flashing artifacts when FSR was turned on, so upscaling isn't an option with this card. Next is Mafia Definitive Edition, which is a remake of the classic Mafia 2002 game and it runs really well at high settings. We get a decent 40 to 50 FPS without micro stutters, so it's definitely playable. The next game is Atomic Heart. This is a first person shooter developed by a Russian game developer known as Munfish and at medium settings we get a reasonable 50 to 55 FPS with drops in action packed scenes but it's still playable and if you lower some of the settings you can get better performance. The next game is the finals. This is a free to play first person shooter with some great physics and you can squeeze out around 55 FPS. Overall, an acceptable gaming experience enough to give you a win regardless of the action packed gameplay with multiple visual effects. Next we looked at Counter Strike 2. Surprisingly, you can run Counter Strike 2 even with a 2013 flagship. Using competitive settings you can get more than 100 FPS, which is very playable, so if you exclusively wanted to run CS with a GPU like this, you can definitely pull it off. The next game we tried was Doom Eternal. This is another relatively recent game that the drivers of our 780 Ti have never heard of and to make matters worse, it runs on the Vulkan API. Here, the 780 Ti struggles at high settings and the 3GB of VRAM don't help our case. The game runs at 20 to 30 FPS with sluggish movement and once we switch the settings to low, the 3GB of VRAM seem to be enough and we get around 40 FPS but I still wouldn't call it a good playable experience due to the noticeable input lag. Conclusion. Despite being 11 years old and not having driver support, the GTX 780 Ti has surprisingly been able to run most games. We were also limited by the 3GB of VRAM and some of the more recent titles that required DX12 support failed to launch at all, but for all other games, the Kepler GPU still gave its best. Of course, we have come a long way since then and GPUs are more efficient and thermals have also greatly improved especially on the Founders Edition cards like the one I just tested. As for the Kepler flagship, its gaming glory days are over and it's mostly just a collector's item at this point so it has to retire. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment, give us your experience and tell us if you're rocking one of these. See you soon.